Hey there, this is Professor John Gallagher, and I'm so glad you've decided to learn to build apps. Congratulations! Now before we dive into programming in Swift and learning to build apps, we've got to make sure that you've got a few things. First up is an Apple developer account. So pull up your browser and go to developer.apple.com. Now you'll probably see a screen that looks a little bit different than this. Apple is constantly updating this with new resources and new information. Now there's good news. The base Apple developer account is free. And there's more good news if you've been using an iOS device. If you've ever bought anything over iTunes or in the App Store, used iCloud or Apple Pay, then you've already got an Apple ID. So what we're going to do is simply link that Apple ID to your new Apple developer account. So click the account link at the top of this page. And if you don't have an Apple ID, just go down here to where it says create yours now. Otherwise, just log in with the email address that's associated with your Apple ID and use that Apple ID's password. You might be asked to approve your login through two-factor authentication, and you'll also be asked to approve any terms of service associated with your Apple developer account. Now I want to point out some other things too. Setting up the Apple developer account is free. Now you might see some invitations to join the Apple developer program. That does cost money. At the time of this recording, it's $99 a year, but you really only need to sign up for the $99 program when you want to submit your apps to the App Store. The free Apple developer account that you just signed up for is all you need to start developing apps. And you can also install those apps on any devices that you connect directly to your computer so you can share your apps with your friends and family. Now there is one caveat, at least at the time that I'm recording this video, if you have the free Apple developer account, Apple will expire any of the apps that you install directly on iOS devices in about a week. So just be aware that if you've installed any of your own apps on devices or shared them with friends and family members, you might have to reinstall them after seven days unless you have the $99 account. But if you're just starting out, it'll be a while before you submit anything to the App Store, so just use the free account. Now some more good news, if you're taking this course as part of an educational institution, or if you're part of a nonprofit organization or an approved government entity in certain countries, there are ways to waive that $99 fee to avoid the seven day timeout. Now you can search online for more information about this, and if you're taking this course as part of a university or school program, your instructor may have some more details. Now for those of you that do create apps and submit them to the App Store, please let me know. I love trying out apps from former students and sharing the success of students who have learned from my content. It's super rewarding to hear from you, so please stay in touch. Now let's talk the software that we need to build apps. The software we're going to be using to build apps is called Xcode. It's Apple's professional development software, it's free, and it's the same stuff that all of the developers at Apple use when they write your iOS, iPad, Watch, TV, and Mac software. Now you'll find Xcode in the Mac App Store, so let's launch the App Store, search for Xcode, and pull up that page. The reason why I have a cloud in the upper right-hand corner instead of the Get button is because I've already installed this software, but click whatever button shows up in this spot. It'll take a while to install Xcode, maybe as long as an hour, depending on the speed of your internet connection. And there's another thing to be aware of. If you scroll down, you'll see that Xcode only takes up about 12 gigabytes on your Mac, but that's not how much you need to install Xcode. So the Xcode install process will actually uncompress multiple files, and it'll need much more than what's displayed here, probably around 25 gigabytes to do the whole install. Now when it's done, these extra files will be deleted, but a lot of students have been surprised that they had 12 gigabytes of free space on their Mac, but Xcode kept asking for more than twice that before the install would work. So be prepared to move files off of your hard drive if you're tight on space. Now when you're waiting for the download, you can check out the details of Xcode down below. Make sure that you're using at least Mac OS Catalina or greater to take advantage of the features that we're going to be showing in this course. Xcode might even require you to download a later version of Mac OS for the install, depending on the version of Xcode that you're using, just follow any upgrade instructions if you're prompted to do so. Now since the install is going to take a long time, I'm going to pause the video here, feel free to do the same, just leave the App Store up and downloading in the background, you can go grab a beverage, or you can fast forward to the end of this video and watch the keys to success, and when you come back, you should see the progress indicator circle is gone, and you'll have an open button up here. Just click on that, that will launch Xcode, if you're asked to approve anything downloaded over the internet, it's okay to do that, you're safe, and you'll likely also be asked to install install some additional components. If asked, go ahead and do that as well. Now when Xcode launches, it's going to look like this, and we don't need the App Store open anymore, so you can go ahead and quit out of that. And now we need to configure Xcode to work with our accounts, and notice that it says accounts plural here. So we're going to add two accounts to Xcode, your Apple developer account, and we'll add another account for a service called GitHub. Now if you're new to software development, you probably don't have a GitHub account. So open your browser and head to github.com and click on sign up for GitHub and get your new account. That's also free. Now GitHub is one of the most important sites in the lives of software developers. Microsoft actually bought this company for several billion dollars a few years back, and GitHub is a few things. First, it's the largest online software repository in the world. Think of it as a big library. It's a great place to go and look for code examples, some projects that you want to learn from, or projects that you want to build off of or contribute to. Now GitHub is also a tool for version control. In this way, you can consider GitHub as a place where you can back up versions of your projects to the cloud for safekeeping. 
So in case anything happens to your code and you want to go back to an earlier version and use that, or if you want to build off of an earlier version of code without interrupting the original copy, you can do all of that by using GitHub. Now GitHub is also a great tool for team collaboration so several people can work on the same project at the same time, and your instructor might even set up a classroom GitHub account so that you can submit projects and assignments for class. Now GitHub is also a place where you can post your software development portfolio online for others to see. And most employers that are hiring software developers today look at the public accounts of potential employees to get a sense of what kind of projects someone has worked on, their learning progression as a software developer, and because of that, you probably want to add your GitHub account to your LinkedIn profile too. And another thing that you might want to do for convenience is to put Xcode in your application doc. And if you want to do that, just open a finder window, open the application folder, find Xcode, drag it and drop it into the doc and it'll be there for easy access. Now we're done with the finder so we can close this window and then back in Xcode, head up to this Xcode menu and select preferences. And from the dialog that shows up, click the accounts tab and then click the plus icon in the lower left corner. Select Apple ID from the list, click the continue button and then enter the email associated with your Apple ID that's the same one that you just used to link to an Apple developer account. Select next enter your Apple ID password, press return or select next, and there's a chance the first time that you do this you'll be asked to approve some things from a security standpoint, just approve anything that you're asked to, and now your Apple ID is your developer ID in Xcode. Now my setup might look a little different than yours because I do have a paid Apple developer program account, but you should be good, so now let's set up your GitHub account. So we'll head back to the lower left hand corner, click that plus icon again, this time find and select GitHub, not GitHub Enterprise or any of the other GitHub options, just plain GitHub, click continue, and under account, enter your GitHub user ID. And you'll see you're being asked for a token. Now GitHub has switched to using tokens instead of straight passwords for its security authentication, and you get a token by returning to GitHub after you've logged in. So here I am in my browser, I'm already logged into GitHub, and then head to the upper right hand corner where this circle represents your account. Now pull down this menu and select settings, and then scroll down and on the left hand side look for developer settings. Click that, then on the left hand side again you'll see personal access tokens, click that, and then on the right you'll see generate new token. Click that button and then under note give the token a name, Xcode would be a good name since this token is going to be used in Xcode, and then underneath this select the scope of access or how much access the user of this token gets. Now frankly by clicking on repo here that should be enough for you. But since I use GitHub pretty extensively via Xcode, I'm going to select everything. Now you'd want to be a bit more conservative with security if you were worried about someone else having access to your Mac, and your employer will likely have far tighter security. If you're curious about how scope works, you can click on read more about OAuth scopes for more documentation, but selecting everything is going to be fine for me since I'm a company of one and my computer is very secure. And so with everything selected, I'm just going to click on this green generate token button, and this very long alphanumeric value that's generated is the token that we need to paste into Xcode. So you can either click on the clipboard icon or highlight the value and copy it, then return to Xcode, paste this value into Xcode in the token field, then click the sign in button and congratulations, you've just set up Xcode to work with GitHub. And with our setup done, you can quit out of Xcode and close your browser. Now here's a quick but important pro tip. You should really be using a password management system. Consider this to be a must have. Just do a search online for Mac and iOS password management system. I use 1Password, but there are a bunch of great tools that are out there that you can choose from that will help you with password hygiene to make sure that you're using good passwords, to make sure that you've got backups of your passwords, to help you auto record new passwords and to autofill passwords across all of your devices. So be sure to find time to do that if you don't already have one. Now also, before we get into building apps, I want to share some keys to success that I've learned from my hundreds of students over several years of teaching app development. And the first is code often. Learning to program is like learning a foreign language, and the more that you speak a new language, the better you're going to get. Same thing with programming. Now I've deliberately created the videos in this course to be a half hour in length or less, and hopefully this makes it easier for you to complete a video or two every day. And if you do that, you'll really see yourself progress, and you'll have fewer big gaps in time where you don't code and where you might forget what you've already learned. Now students who put off their work until the day before assignments are due almost always struggle. So do a little bit of work every day, you'll find that you retain more of your knowledge, you'll see yourself improve, and your learning process will be less frustrating. Also note that Xcode is a fantastic helper for you. It formats and color codes what you type in, it sometimes catches typos, it can make suggestions if it can identify an error that you've entered, it's like having a little buddy on your shoulder when you code that will help you out along the way. So there's never been a better time to be a programmer, the tools are fantastic and they're getting better all the time. Just try to code every day if you can, and you'll really notice the improvement. 
Now this series is definitely meant to be learning by doing, so you're going to want to have a browser open while you're watching videos and also have Xcode open. And you'll want to pause the videos, then tab over to Xcode, complete the steps, and build apps along the way. Now you'll also find that it can be very useful after you've completed the video and gone through all the steps to open up a new project or playground and try to repeat those steps without the use of the video or reference materials. This is a great way to make sure that you're really retaining knowledge. And if you struggle with anything, you can go back and rewatch the video, try again. And if you're using the textbook that I've created to accompany these videos, you'll find that there are a bunch of exercises at the ends of most sections. Many of those exercises have solution videos. That's just another great way to make sure that you're retaining the concepts and techniques that you've learned. Now, if you're taking this as part of a class, your instructor might assign some of those exercises as homework or use them in class like I do when I teach this course as a flipped class. But even if not, know that those exercises are there to help you prepare for your tests and more importantly, to make sure that you've really understood the material. Now also experiment with new projects and playgrounds. If you've learned techniques, you can always open a new project or a new playground to see if you can apply what you've just learned in a different context. Programming should be wildly fun, and it's especially enjoyable when you start to build your own stuff. Even if it's just small parts of an app or experiments with a technique that you've learning inside of a playground. So if you're wondering, hey, I wonder what would happen if I do this, or if I make a change to the technique that I just learned. Well, just give it a try as those questions arise. You can do it as part of a new project or playground so that you don't mess up your existing work. And this is a great way to strengthen your skills as a software developer. Now also remember, if you ever get stuck, there are a ton of additional resources available to help you out. If you're using the textbook that I've written to accompany this work, under every video there's a reference section that covers the techniques that you've just learned. There are animated GIFs that can show you how the techniques are applied, there are copy and paste code examples, there are even online quizzes. The book is searchable, and you can also search online for help. So if you've never coded before, do know that there's a site online that's a friend to all software developers that's called Stack Overflow. Now Stack Overflow is the most popular question and answer site for programmers, and if you search this site, you'll You'll almost always find that somebody else has encountered the same problem that you have and you're likely to find a fast answer. So I definitely recommend that you visit Stack Overflow and create your own account. Also, as you learn more, you're going to be able to answer other people's questions too. And you'll get reputation points for doing so. And something that's important to be aware of, employers pay attention to your Stack Overflow behavior. So if you learn and help other people, that's a great indication that you'll be a good team member too. And the opposite is also true, so for anybody that's snarky or mean to other people online, that's the kiss of death when it comes to getting hired. So make sure that you've got good online etiquette. Now GitHub can also be an amazing learning resource. There are lots of coding examples online. YouTube and blogs can also be great resources for learning more. And as you go through this material, you're going to be more comfortable looking things up online and learning on your own. And that's a vital skill for anybody working in tech. Now, Apple's also got some wonderful resources online as well. You can explore Apple's resources and find coding examples. There's guidance on user interface design. And also, every year in June, Apple runs a huge event that they call the Worldwide Developer Conference, or WWDC. Now, Apple will post all of the learning videos and workshops from these events online. In fact, many of my former students have gone to work for Apple, and it's always great to see a former student presenting their work for Apple at the WWDC. So check those videos out. They're a great way to learn advanced techniques and to keep up to date with new innovations coming from Apple. Also, if you're a student, every year Apple offers scholarships for the WWDC, so keep your eye out for those every spring and consider applying for those as well. And finally, I really want to hear from you. Creating content and releasing videos for free on YouTube is definitely a lonely endeavor. So I really love hearing from people that are using this work, who are learning from these videos and having fun. So whether you're an instructor, a classroom student, or an independent learner, please take time to drop a comment below the YouTube videos. And also do know that if you like or subscribe, that's also used by YouTube and their search algorithms to surface these videos. And that can be tremendously helpful to me as I try to reach even more students. So if you take a small amount of time to do that, you've got my sincere serious thanks. Also, if you're an educator, do share this material with other colleagues. It's great to get the word out there. And as an added bonus, if you take a photo or a screenshot of what you're doing based on what you've learned in my videos, and you tag it with hashtag iOS code crush, and you post it to Twitter, I have my teaching assistants go through all of the posts on those hashtags every week or so, and they select one of those posts to receive one of the much coveted My Mac Builds Apps laptop stickers. So share your work under the hashtag and you might win one too. Now also, if you're curious, I've got lots of other course content online as well. So for example, you'll see maker and engineering content videos on things like how to build a robot that you can control from an iOS app, or as a way to use an iOS app with a Raspberry Pi to get it to play sounds remotely, a sort of online ventriloquism, always fun. Seeking Professor G-U-R. Come to the right place you have. So if you subscribe and revisit the channel, hopefully you'll find some other things beyond this course that you like as well. 
and if you follow on Twitter or Instagram, I often share announcements of related materials on there too. So I'm really looking forward to celebrating your success. Thanks so much for letting me be part of your coding journey. I hope you have a lot of fun at this. Best of luck. Now it's time for big learning. Giddy up.